machine learning's been around for 70 years since post World War II, so it's it's really not new, and it's had many boom and busts. And you know, to that extent, do do, do you all think that this is sort of like one of those booms over the last 70 years, or do you think it's it's really different this time, which so often it isn't? But yeah, go on, Daniel. That's a great point. It's not new, and um, generative AI is not new, and, and language modeling is not new. Uh, the models that we've seen of late, I think, are an order of magnitude more sophisticated than you know anything that, that I've personally seen before. We also have, um, with the, the now in the public domain, ChatGPT, uh, a, a generalized large language model. So it's been trained on this really, really broad corpus um, and so it's not a special purpose model, which is, which is what a lot of other models were. But these are not new technologies in and of themselves. I think what is new is that we're, we're probably um, seeing for the first time the democratization of those, of those algorithms. And that's an inflection point. The other thing I would add is, you know, you have this confluence of, of record low processing and storage costs. Um, you have record amount of data, which is effectively digitized and accessible digitally now. Um, and, um, you know, you have this machine learning working and you have data science. So you have this confluence of four factors that has really facilitated this democratization of it. Um, so excluding compliance and risk management for the moment, because we'll get to that momentarily. Um, but but in from each of your sort of day jobs, so to speak, or your careers or what you're doing at Amazon, TIA, S&P, SockGen, respectively. Ruben, why don't you start in terms of your use cases and approaches at AWS? Yeah, I mean, there are sort of three general use cases that we tend to focus on and see our customers implement, right? One is around sort of customer interaction, right? So think about a financial advisor having a conversation with an investor the conversation being transcribed in near real time, the transcription giving rise to certain queries fired off against the knowledge base, the knowledge base articles that are relevant to the conversation come back. And in the past, that's sort of where it ended, right? Now the, the financial advisor could maybe pass on those articles after the call, but now with generative AI, those articles that are the relevant com the sort of conversation points or new information to the conversation can be summarized in real time and relayed back to the customer, to the, the retail investor or professional investor in, in near real time, right? So that's one use case. Um, and somebody's compared that to it's like playing chess with Kasparov um, whispering in your ear. Uh, and so I think, in, you know, going back to your earlier question a little bit is that I do think it's different in the sense that these use cases are unlocking um, or the, the, the use cases that are being unlocked by this technology are very, very different and somewhat revolutionary, right? And in that sense, it's, yeah, it's incremental, but it's incremental in a very uh, sort of significant way. Thanks. Um, why don't we go to Satish for the moment? So, so in terms of use cases, again, uh, from coming from a banking background and um, within the investment banking space, I, I see a huge potential in terms of ideating the research aspect of uh, investment research. So that, that is a prime use case which is being used, uh, of course, with the risk and compliance factor, which we'll discuss in, um, in, in a short while from now. But that is one use case. The second is also from an advisory standpoint, um, you see generative AI primarily helping in terms of lessening the, the bandwagon of um, inquiries which keep coming in terms of product curation in terms of channeling these requests internally, uh, thereby you are able to actually get the context from wide varieties of sources of data, and then internalizing that and training on your internal data so that you can have a prompt to access that data within the organization. That's the second primary use case which I have seen. The third is in terms of generating documents. Um, uh, the documents could be in terms of uh, origination of uh, any deals. So that is where, again, we it is not in a production kind of state, but it would give you a good starter point based of all the facts which is available within the organization. So that's a great uh, use case which I've seen uh, using generative AI. And Martin, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think what Ruben and Satish kind of covered, basically what we see out there, but I also want to say that we're moving away from fine-tuning models into grounding models. So for example, your 10 Qs and, and, and 10 Ks that usually uh, takes a lot of time for analysts to pull through and summarize and figure out, look at the footnotes and, and, and synthesize and figure out what that means. Uh, 
generative AI can now be used or are now being used to be able to take those uh, reports, uh, synthesize them, and feed uh, real um, and within a very short period of time summaries or queries that can answer questions that usually would take weeks to do. Other places we see them used is in uh, fraud analytics. Uh, usually, uh, for example, credit card uh, uh, cases where you want real time, so you push real transaction data from locations and see if there are any anomalies it picks out. You can use generative AI for that. You can also, we've seen it used in complaints uh, identification and routing. Today, FINRA requires most financial service companies to report on complaints. So being able to, in real time, figure out whether it's from a portal or from calls, in the call center, being able to figure out, isolate complaints, summarize them, and ship them out to the right people to resolve them, and in parallel, ship them to FINRA for reporting purposes. Uh, those are some areas we see um, proliferate use of AI, and, and we begin to see that AI is especially generative AI becoming more of a commodity than uh, specialized tool in the last few weeks. Thanks, and, and last but not least, Daniel. Um, I think my co-panelists have touched on uh, the main use cases, document generation. Um, I'm not sure if anybody mentioned code generation, uh, but I'll throw that one out there. I think from an investment management standpoint, what's most interesting to me is the ability to extract features from text. As Ruben mentioned, there's long been uh, recognition that a lot of information is not in a database format. It's unstructured textual content. Um, and, and how you pull out the meaningful information from that has required uh, a, lot of, a lot of thought and care. So uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, my team did some work looking at the risk and MDNA section in 10Ks, as Martin mentioned, um, and, and we found that, by and large, most companies copy and paste those sections from, from one particularly risk, from one filing to the next, unless something has really changed. And so just looking at the, the magnitude of changes in a rules-based way, um, going long names that have preserved their language and shorting names that have uh, modified their language is, is a, uh, an efficacious trading strategy and a backtest. That's without any context as to what actually changed. Now, with a model like uh, large language modeling, a generative AI large language model, we could actually apply context to that and I'm sure improve uh, the signal substantially.